Yeah, my name is Jessica Domichev and I'm a project officer at David Archaeological Trust working on the Coastal Uplands Heritage and Tourism Project, also known as CAPAP. And today I'll be talking a bit more about the project and also some of our recent work in the Priscelli Mountains. So the Coastal Uplands Heritage and Tourism Project. It's an EU funded project and an interreg project as well between Ireland and Wales. And the aim is to work with local upland communities to help enhance their knowledge and understanding of their natural and cultural resources, as well as um, supporting the local upland um, businesses in sharing these resources through sustainable tourism and hopefully bringing more money back into these areas. Now we have three main partners um, in the project. We have Aberystwyth University, University College Dublin, and David Archaeological Trust. And the four upland areas that we're focusing on are the Bruselli Mountains and Cambrian Mountains in Wales, and the Wicklows and Blackstairs Mountains in Ireland. And the natural and cultural resources um, that we're focusing on, they're called our four themes, are archaeology, geology and landforms, community life, so myths, legends, old photos, artefacts, and also biodiversity as well. And my role at DAT on the project is to advise on the archaeology and heritage. So I've been working on creating um, citizen science activities for locals and tourists. But also I've been working a lot on the digitisation and reconstruction of sites. And this is once again to enhance understanding, knowledge, but also to promote these sites as well. And the aim of the project is we want at least five sites in each upland area to be digitised and reconstructed. And one of the sites we've chosen in the Priscelli Mountains um, is the Priscelli Ridge, also known as the Golden Road. Now this isn't just one small site, this is actually a routeway running 7.4 miles long, it takes about four hours to walk across and the reason why I want to be talking about that site today is over the last couple of weeks my colleague and I have been out on the Priscelli Ridge digitising some of the key sites. So just to give an idea of where the Golden Road is for those who don't know, this is our project's map of the Priscelli Mountains region and the Golden Road runs from where it says Fort, so that's Foyle Dragon Hill Fort, all the way through to Foyle Aero there. And if we have a closer look at the Golden Road, I've sort of plotted some of the key archaeological sites that we want to enhance through CAPAP. Not all of the sites will be digitised um, or reconstructed because they don't lend themselves to that. But today is going to be a little bit of a whistle-stop tour through some of the sites we've digitised and give a bit of background as well um, to them. Um, the reason why Kapat decided to work on the Golden Road is it's so rich in archaeology, geology, um, biodiversity and the community lives as well. There's lots of myths and legends. However, we found that there wasn't really one place where you had the information on all those different themes. We also found that there wasn't really a um, sort of main map for the routeway that incorporates all those themes. I know DAT have um, a map, so do the National Park Authority. Um, however, they only cover some of the sites, um, mostly relating to prehistory. Um, and the links with the um, Stonehenge bluestones are some of the outcrops, the bluestones that believe come from there. And so what we wanted to do through Kapat was we wanted to create a more sort of user-friendly map as well, because we often find that when we're on the site, even with the maps, it's still quite hard to actually locate some of these sites, especially the outcrops. There are so many outcrops out there in the Pacellis. And even uh, myself and my colleagues have had to sort of trek up and down the hillside to try and find them. So through Kapat, we wanted to use um, our sort of digital resources to really help um, show what there is out there on the Prese Ridge. Um, and the idea is we want to create a map which will be accessed via, we hopefully have a paper version, a version on the website and a version on an app. Um, we should hopefully have QR codes at either end of the walk which people can access. And the idea is you'll be able to walk through the landscape and looking at the map, there'll be interactive points on key sites 
and you'll be able to click on one of those and it brings up for some sites a 3D digital model so you get a better idea of what the site looks like as a whole and some of them will have interactive points on with information. We'll also include sort of text. We might have voiceover of myths and legends tied to the site and um, possible soundscapes as well. Um, and something that I'd really like to do is um, include photos or digitizations of artifacts from some of these sites. Because once the site's been excavated and artifacts go back to the museum, that connection between the two are usually sort of lost. When you're walking along, you don't really think about the artifacts there. So we want to create an interactive map, it's user friendly, and be able to bring all that information um, together. So to give an idea of how long the Priscelli Ridge has actually um, been used for, some of the sites along the ridge have evidence dating back to the Mesolithic and others all the way through to the modern period. So most of the archaeology relates to prehistory and quarrying of the outcrops. Um, there's possible Neolithic axe factory as well. Um, there's also a lot of prehistoric burial mounds. There's a lot of Bronze Age um, barrows. There's also a lot of um, enclosures from prehistory through to modern day. So there's a lot of information there. And like I said, myself and my colleague have been out the last couple of weeks digitizing some of the key sites. So I will be having just a whistle stop tour through some of them and a bit of detail on them. So the first site I want to start off with is Croismahangel um, Bronze Age Barrow. It's in the corner of the field, right at the start um, of the walkway. And this is a monument which is used for funerary purposes. And sadly, this is what it looks like today. So it's really easy to walk past. Um, it's been destroyed in the, um, we think, sort of early 20th century. It's actually on some of um, the sort of 1900 maps. Um, so it must have had something there before. Um, but the reason why we wanted to highlight this is this is actually an interesting site and the artefacts from here are amazing. So it's had two excavations done on the site. Um, the first one in um, 1958 to 1959 by someone called Wilfred Harrison um, who was connected with Tenby Museum. And then in 2007, the Spaces Project run by Tim Darville and the late Jeff Wainwright did a geophysical survey and they found that there was a positive anomaly still there which the earlier excavation had um, not picked up on and missed. So um, in 2011, Spaces decided to go back and do an excavation. And from this, you can't see it very <coughs> clearly, but they found that the barrow had three phases to it. So the first phase had lots of pre-barrow features. So um, there was a pit, post holes, possible half, and a um, arc palisaded um, sort of trench, which they believe might have been a complete circular palisaded enclosure, but that needs further investigation. And then phase two is when it became the mound. So they placed the um, urns with cremations in and covered it in turf. Um, and then phase three, which is a secondary burial, which was placed um, in the top. Now, as we could see from that photo, for Kapat, we couldn't really digitize um, the site. However, the artifacts, the urns, are amazing. And we wanted to do some work on those. So this is only one of the urns. So this is a picture when we were in the museum. And um, this is us processing it in the final sort of image at the end. So four cremation urns were found. One is in the National Museum of Wales and the other three in Tenby Museum. And they're on display and they're amazing. And I really suggest you go and have a look. Now, just like to point out here on this slide, um, it's the same with the other slides. The 3D models I'll be showing, I've only got sort of static images of them. Um, they are on something um, on a website called Sketchfab. And on this, you can actually move the um, models around, but I'm not going to be um, showing you that um, on this slide because going back and forth to the website and back, something will go wrong. So if you do want to see the model um, sort of moving it around, the 3D, how it looks, um, then come to me afterwards and we can go and have a look. So that's the barrow. The next I wanted to move on to was Boyle Dragan Hill Fort. Now this is the one that we've done the most work on. 
um, because Kapa have been collaborating with the Pembrokeshire Coast National Park Authority, Thomas, on um, an interpretation project. So on this site, the hill fort is actually going to be fully reconstructed. Um, so we're going to have two views for the reconstruction. One's going to be a static view from further afield. And the second view, you're going to be able to stand in the entrance of um, one of the entrances of the hill fort. And you're going to be able to use your phone and get a 360 degree view. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. Now this site is sort of famously known as being an Iron Age hill fort, however um, it has earlier evidence in the Bronze Age with the three cairns on top, which I'll discuss a bit later. It's the largest hill fort in the area and one of a cluster of hill forts in um, <coughs> West Wales. And it's famous for having roughly 270 hot platforms. So they're the sort of dips on the picture there and that's where they've levelled off land um, for the placement of huts. Whether or not they're all contemporary, um, we're not sure, um, but we think there would have been a lot at one time. What the site was used for, we think it would um, have had a sort of multifunctional use. We think it would have been quite a hub in the community, possibly um, a leader sort of living here. We think it could have been a place of um, craft, trade. Um, there's other elements of the site which have less hub platforms, which we think could be for maybe markets, uh, meeting places. So lots of things going on here. And we probably had as well with the cans at the top, um, a ritual funerary space as well. Now, even though the site, lots of people have known about it, there's only ever been one excavation. And that was done in 1899 by a man called Baring Gold. Um, now, he is a really interesting character and a presentation could be done on himself alone, um, he was an early archaeologist um, working in France, Cornwall and Wales. He was one of the top ten novelists of his time, writing on lots of different subjects. He has a, also had lots of different roles in the community as well. Um, around this time as well, he excavate, excavated St David's Head Promontory Fort. So, um, yeah, he had a lot of things going on. And here we have a plan that his colleagues produced and the numbers represent the hut platforms that they excavated. The next sort of work that was done was in 1969 when the Royal Commission and the Geography Department at Portsmouth Polytechnic um, did a topographical survey. However, when looking back at 1899 plan, there wasn't actually much of a difference between them. So I always say hats off to those in 1899. They did a really good job. And then the most recent sort of hot off the press work, um, we've had some new data come out publicly called LIDAR data, and it sort of shows sites in a different way. It's a little bit blurry here, but you can really see those hot platforms. Um, it reminds me of the top of a golf, well, a golf ball, to be honest, with those dips. And from this LIDAR data, we um, also looks like there's more um, hot platforms in the northeast extension up here than was previously thought. So we're learning more and more um, as we've been looking at this site. Now, through the excavations and people looking at the site, we think there were different phases um, to the hill fort. So first off, um, the first phase of the site was in the Bronze Age with the Bronze Age burial cans. This is a typical place for um, cans like this. When you stand um, on Royal Dragan and you look at the nearby hilltops, you can see a lot more sort of barrows dotted around. Now, these um, three cans haven't been formally excavated. However, the poor things have been dug into by antiquarians. There's a trig point on the centre of the middle one. People have walked up and down, people move the stones and people also take stones away as well. So we think when they were first constructed, they would have been a little bit tidier, a little bit fuller than what they are today. And then the next phase of construction is in the Iron Age. Um, and we think the next phase is when we had this first rampart in a ditch and the rampart's made out of stone. It encloses about 100 hut platforms, so straight away this had um, a lot of people here. We also think at this time, this is when um, they constructed a low-lying wall, known as a kerb, around 
the three Bronze Age cans there. You can't really see it on the ground, but aerial photographs and LIDAR, um, you can really notice it. Um, so maybe this suggests that they were separating sort of an everyday space to one that's um, re um, religious ritual sort of space. And this is also supported by, if you think about how much stone was required for those ramparts, they probably got the stone from the ditch, but those barrows there are easy access to stone. For those not to have touched that and put the curb around suggests that they really respected their ancestors. There's also in the excavation report a suggestion that there's an entrance, well, and three entrances to the south, um, west, and the east. But looking at aerial photographs and LIDAR, there's possibly an entrance to the north, but that needs to be looked into further um, because that might just be a modern um, trackway um, that's been um, popped up over the last sort of 100 years. We then have second phase of construction, which is this lower stone ramp up this time it doesn't have a um, inner ditch and it closes about 120 hut platforms so once again another large number of people um, at this hill fort we then have a final um, construction to the northeast so this one the um, walls aren't as robust as the um, other two um, ramparts there's also a lot less hill, um, hot platforms um, in there. So we think that this might have had a different use, maybe a meeting place, market, something like that. Now, in the excavations, they also found um, quite a few artefacts as well, dating from the Iron Age through to the Romano-British period. So they found pottery from both periods. There was whetstones. Um, we've got spindle wells, some of them really nicely decorated. We have a possible armlet as well that was produced out of shale. It looks like it would have been possibly for a child, but we're not sure. And then we have these really interesting stone lamps, which were interpreted at the time as, well, these stone bowls were interpreted at the time as stone lamps. However, when we look at them, um, we're not really sure what they are, and I think further investigation is needed. They also found array of beads as well, um, glass beads, clay, fiance. Oh, one of my favourite beads um, is a glass one, which when found um, showed evidence of in antiquity it had been broken and then glued back together again. And these are all on display at Tembe Museum, um, so I would definitely recommend having a look. So through the interpretation project with the National Park, we've got the reconstruction happening, but through Kapat, we wanted to enhance that even more. So what we decided to do with Tembe Museum um, is we've digitised some of the artefacts. And then we've also digitised the site as well. And you can see us playing around with interactive points. And like I said, on the model, you can zoom in, zoom out, move it around, have a proper look. And then this isn't really for the public, it's more for us to sort of gain a bit more information um, from it. But we've been applying different visualisations, different lighting, different colours to bring out features. And here you can really see the curb wall going around and you really see those hot platforms as well. So exciting stuff with Bolgergarn. Um, next site, quickly fly through. I'm going to miss the common and outcrop. Um, we haven't been able to digitise that um, at the moment, but we've got some nice photos. The outcrop is linked to the blue stones of Stonehenge. But I just wanted to move on to the, another Bronze Age barrow at the end of Carmenon. So I don't know if you see it clearly, but that's Carmenon. And then we have the um, carnage just at the end of this three kilometre long. It's called the Stone River and it's a glacial fluvial feature. And we have taken photos um, of the site, but we haven't processed it yet to create the um, model. So I've just got some photos here. Um, at the moment, it's very different to the Corus Mahangal um, Barrow. It's not <laughs> formed of turf, it's made out of stone. Um, and at the moment, it's sort of got the exposed um, kist. And here you've got some of the stones, which look like they would have prop them up, they've collapsed in. <coughs> now this site in 2007, Geophysical Survey was carried out by the Spaces Project 
um, and then that showed that there was different phases um, to the site. So they decided to do an excavation in 2011. And here's an image. And from here, they found four phases to the site. So the first phase, um, they think they found a pit which would have held a standing stone or a very close um, stone pair. And it's in quite a significant position because it sort of is over the top of a spring um, which goes down that sort of stone river. <coughs> We've then got the second phase, which is when they had a circular enclosed ditch with a low outer bank. And it seems to... Um, well, I can't see very clearly, but this is the Stone River and it sort of goes round and encloses the end of the stones and there's suggested to be an entrance to the southwest there. And then phase three, um, it looks like they placed a stone circle um, within the middle of it, a bit off centre. And then these are some of the suggested stones. And then phase four is when it became a... Um, Bombs Age Town, with, um, they built the kist and added the stones over the top of the stone circle <coughs> and formed um, what it is today. So one of the ideas that we had um, was maybe um, we could reconstruct each phase um, for this site to make it clearer to understand. Because when you see it, you don't really, um, can't really sort of visualise very well those different phases. And then quickly down the slope, so the map that we'll have for Kapat will have the additional footpaths going off. But I um, want to go to Kangoi Dog. Another outcrop linked to um, the blue stones of Stonehenge. I just want to quickly talk about this one, just show you the model that we've got. Um, we think it came out really well. It was really hard um, because the outcrop is sort of on the top and it's actually terraced down the side. So trying to get the detail um, was a bit frustrating, but we got there in the end. Now, this site had geophysical survey carried out on it and also excavation in 2014 to 16 by Mike Parker Pearson um, on the Stones of Stonehenge project. And um, they excavated sort of at the side here, and um, I think they found a um, stone platform where he believed the stones would have um, been sort of prized off onto that and taken away from there. And then finally, we've got Khan Alu Hill for an outcrop. Once again, another outcrop, but this time um, used in a slightly different way. And I really like this site. Um, from Khan Alu, you can see Royal Dragan Hill for and vice versa. But these are two very different sites, not only the size as well. Khan Alu is a lot, lot smaller. And it seems to be a lot more defensive as well. So on one side, you've got sort of a steep drop of the outcrop and then on the other you've got this sort of more leveled d-shaped area with like a stone rampart and um, going through which is sort of crumbling away and um, we think we may have had some huts in there at some point um, interestingly there's this really big stone i'm sure i've got a closer photo big stone um, which looks like someone's been trying to dig it out at some point in time um, but gave up so that's quite a nice little bit to um, add on and what's so important about this site is it's got, I always pronounce this wrong, a chevet de frise round the front here. And this is sort of for defensive purposes and this is where they would have um, put lots of little stones, sort of sharp point facing up a lot of the time and it makes it harder for people, horses and people to get across um, and sort of attack the hill fort. It's then got a really nice entrance as well coming up here um, with a lot of larger stones on either side but it's sort of blocked off up here which I need to um, find out a bit more from Ken about. <laughs> so that was sort of a whistle stop tour through some of the sites um, but that's the sort of information and models that we'll be including on the interactive map. Um, we are with the National Park We're going to be ho hopefully holding another public interpretation workshop with them, um, once sort of Peter Lorimer has done the reconstructions, we want to show people and talk about what other things we can add, text, voiceover, things like that to make it more user-friendly. 
And also with the digitizations and reconstructions, um, there's still a couple of things we want to improve um, on some of our models. So they're not been made publicly available yet, but we're slowly going to be doing that sort of one by one. So if you are interested in keeping um, up to date with what's happening, then on um, Dovid's and Kapat's social media and website, um, we should be adding those onto that. So thank you.